All right, it's time for the 2023 Philadelphia Marathon Race Recap. This race was my fourth attempt at a sub three hour marathon. I did not hit that goal. If you've seen on my Strava or Instagram or the YouTube videos <laughs> prior to this, but I want to do a quick recap going over the Philadelphia marathon race, where things went right for me, where things went wrong and overall how I ended up with a 308.56 and a new PR in the marathon distance. So let's get into it. All right. So as you can see here with the Philly marathon, 308.56 was the marathon PR. That's what the official time was with the Philly Marathon, the official chip time. Uh, moving time, I show a 30902. So the watch time was not far off from the chip time, uh, roughly a 708 minute mile, maybe a little faster than that, um, or a little slower, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever the official is, um, this was my best estimated marathon effort. Obviously the 30650 is gonna be off because it shows here that I ran 26 and a half miles instead of the 26.2. And then um, some other best efforts as well. Like I said, what I really wanna get more into is the overall race, looking at different segments of the race here. So we will start down in center city or city center um, for the first part of the marathon. And as you can see, the marathon starts uh, relatively flat there are actually quite a few hills in this race. I know it looks like you can see here and then further on that the hills kind of taper off, but it doesn't feel like that. But like I said, uh, the first six miles of the race are relatively easy, primarily because you're running in the city. You have a ton of crowd support. Uh, your energy is the best it's gonna be the entire race because you're fresh. You're with a ton of runners, everything feels good. One thing to note with any major metropolitan race, the GPS does not work, so your paces are gonna be all over the place. So if you're not with a pace group, just kind of go by feel. Don't start off too hot or panic and worry that, oh my gosh, like my paces are showing that I'm slower. Uh, just go with it. My plan going into this race, being sick going into this race, was just to start behind the sub three hour group See how I was feeling, knowing that I did basically no taper for this race. I took like a week off um, from running all together before going into this race. I wanted to see how I was feeling and then I would gauge on if I should attempt the sub three or not. But the idea was always keep the sub three hour group kind of in my vision up ahead so that they were always in distance of catching if I felt like I could pick it up later on in the race. And so as you can see here, going through Elevation's relatively flat. I was roughly holding like a 650 to 7, 705 minute mile um, from what I could gauge on when I was hitting the mile markers, as well as like what my watch was saying um, versus like when my watch was hitting mile markers. It looked like I was running roughly a 650, I'd say 655 to 705 through these first like six miles. Um, and then actually it's like almost mile seven here at the river that you hit your first hill. It's an overpass going over the river. Um, but up until that point, relatively flat. Like I said, it's pretty easy because there's good crowd support throughout. And this is by far the easiest part of the race for a multitude of reasons that I've already stated. Um, and there's not much more to say to it. The three hour pace group was ahead of me the entire time, but I could always physically see them. I was running with Danny Runs Philly and Aaron, um, we locked in with Aaron, I don't know, maybe the third, fourth mile. And Aaron was looking at sub three with kind of that same goal of starting out a little slower, staying conservative. And then after some of those hills, maybe pick it up. Mile seven, I think it was, mile six to seven or seven to eight, somewhere in there, you kind of hit your first hill um, with that overpass. And then you hit quite a few other hills kind of going through this neighborhood over into this park over here. Um, so again, early days in the marathon, you know, you aren't even at the half yet. And so some of these hills feel relatively easy because again, you're kind of at your freshest. Uh, the race hasn't really started, especially for the marathon. Here, these hills aren't too bad. Now coming into the park, this is where I'll say the race starts to get hard or harder. Um, is just that one, this park is huge. You feel like you're in it forever if you're not from the area because you can start to see runners coming. So the way this part of the course goes, 
you kind of take a road and you do this like downhill and then uphill into the park. And you also come back through to come to the half. So as you're going into the park, you're seeing uh, runners coming out of the park. And so sometimes, I know for me personally, uh, it can always be hard to gauge how long it's gonna take to get through an area when you see other runners coming back because you think, okay, we can get through this pretty quickly. Um, if you're already seeing like the elites coming through, um, like we were, we were seeing the elites kind of coming through that area already back up that hill. But either way, um, this hill, or this park is pretty large. So just kind of be prepared for that. And it's hilly. You have a downhill going in and then quite a steep uphill um, that kind of feels pretty long coming through. I believe it was the 15K is where we came through here, if I remember correctly. And then you come through the park, as you can see, elevation is, it's, it's rolling hills through. And then when you're coming out of the park, you got a nice downhill. And then you have that same downhill you experienced going into the park. You have that coming out. So you have quite a steep uphill. I would say it's probably the steepest uphill in the entire course that you actually run to get out of the park. You make a turn, um, or no, I, <laughs> uh, I apologize. You make a turn and you stay in the park even longer, um, which is why the park felt like so long, was that you stay in the park for quite some time before you actually make the turn out on to um, go up towards Manioc. But um, either way, as you can see here, um, you kind of make this big uphill and then you stay in the park some more rolling hills um, as you continue to go through Fairmount Park. And then you have that steep downhill going into where you then um, go up and follow the river all the way up into Manioc. And then you basically do like this turn and come back down. But either way, through this park, you got quite a few rollers. I will say this is where like mile, I don't know, at the half is where I started to notice that taking that week off from the, the taper, and being sick where I had just kind of lost that step or edge, whatever you want to call it. I just, I, I knew I didn't have exactly what I was going to need to um, pull off the sub three, or if I did, it was going to be a real fight um, to the end. Here's also, I believe it was mile 15 to 16, where I knew it kind of tapered off um, in terms of the hills, is where I broke off from Danny and Aaron knowing that the sub three hour group had kept kind of breaking farther and farther away. And that if I was gonna make any type of move, it wasn't gonna be like this big move where all of a sudden I was able to cut down to like 640, 630s, 620s. Like I realized at roughly the half, between the half to like mile 16, that like if I'm gonna pick it up to catch the three group, I'm gonna have to start sooner than I had thought. I was planning on maybe at mile 20, so that last 10K, like really picking it up in the last 10K. But at about mile 15 or 16, I realized that if I'm gonna make any move, it's gonna have to be now, and it's gonna be like marginal, a marginal effort, like marginal gain in my pace overall. So just quick, pick up this, the pace a little bit, and hopefully over those like last 10 miles, maybe I can close that gap with the sub three and maybe get that goal. So somewhere here in mile 15 to 16, I um, slowly broke it off from Danny and Aaron. I'm pretty sure it was here because I remember in this downhill, I thought, okay, if I'm gonna pick up the pace, the downhill is the perfect place to kind of get the legs turning over where it's a little easier. And then I can kind of stretch it out here in the flat. Um, I met up with, I believe it was Andrew from Tennessee. Andrew had been picking it up as well. And it was one of those where I almost felt like we were kind of racing each other for a bit, like trying to, like, am I gonna be able to pass this guy and then move on? Or are they gonna keep ahead of me and like kind of keep fighting me? And then Andrew and I kind of just like locked in. I think we held somewhere 18 to 20 was where we held. And then it was some of these small rollers here where I just realized like, even at that picked up pace, like I just, I don't have it. Uh, like I was just a little off, um, like I said, from being sick. And um, like I said, just through here, you're out and these rollers, feel a lot harder when you're at mile 18, mile 20, 22, 24, and then obviously 26. Like these rollers look easy when you're looking at the elevation chart, but when you're out here doing this out and back, and then especially at mile 20 where you hit and then you do that like basically 180 turn, which is just absurd at mile 20 in a marathon when your legs are tired and you've been doing these rollers, 
and the turn is like on a slight like incline. So you're like running up a hill and then you turn and then kind of come like, this is not fun. Whoever is the race coordinator designing this course <laughs> really needs to rethink this because they could easily just do like a go around a block, like do like a big square around a block and then come back down instead of this 180 turn because that is rough. But somewhere in here, I just, I told Andrew like, ah, you can go on ahead, don't let me hold you back. And he was like, no man, keep going. Come on, stay with me. And I was like, I just, I don't think I have it. Like I've done these runs enough now to know like, if I wanna keep running and not walk, cause at this point I'd been passing, Andrew and I had been passing quite a few walkers already at this point. And I kept thinking like, if I don't wanna walk and I wanna run and I wanna potentially get a PR in general, like this is the moment where like, okay, pull back a tiny bit and try and hold a pace where I can continue running through each mile and not stop to walk and I could potentially get a PR. Like I knew it was gonna be close um, on the PR at this point. I knew the sub three was no longer happening. And so holding this pace was more potential of a blow up and just completely falling apart and having to walk and then just losing everything altogether versus like if I can let Andrew go and like kind of fight my ego and just realize that like, hey, a PR is still possible, then that's what I'll do. So like I said, I, I told Andrew to go ahead. He kind of like tried to encourage me for a bit and then realized it wasn't gonna happen. So he went off to the races. Um, and then, like I said, you do that 180, you go back through Maniunk down back towards the um, Institute of Art the, what is it? I think the Franklin Institute of Arts or whatever, the Museum of Art where the, the <laughs> the Rocky statue is and where the start of the race actually was. And um, it was somewhere in here, 21 to I think 24, that Aaron actually passed me. So when we were running with Aaron, I kept saying, mile 20 is where we're gonna like turn it up. Mile 20 is where we're gonna turn it up. And then, like I said, it was at mile 15 or 16 that I realized like, I'm not gonna be able to turn it up at 20. I'm gonna have to like incrementally turn it up at 15. Well, uh, that plan didn't work. <laughs> and so Aaron passed me and he was like, come on, man, let's go, let's go. We got this, let's stick to the plan. And I told Aaron like, man, I don't have it. Like, I don't have that pep in my step that I need to keep up with you. You go on ahead, you're doing great work, keep it up, way to stick to the plan. So Aaron went on ahead. And from that point on, it was a fight for me. So, you know, miles 22 to 26 were definitely a fight. It got a lot harder. Like I said, there wasn't anything crazy. Like when you look at this, this is extremely flat. Obviously when you're struggling near the end of a marathon, nothing feels flat anymore. And then this, the very end, this feels hard. So the half marathon is run on a Saturday for Philly. So there's an 8K and a half that's run on that Saturday. If you go back and watch my vlog, when we did our shakeout, we actually ran out to this section of the half we stopped our shakeout, we cheered runners on, the Winfield Track Club was actually out there cheering on at this point, that's where their like cheer section was. And uh, we were cheering them on, and I remember looking at that hill and being like, man, this hill is not hard. Like I've run this hill a few times in the few times I've visited Philly, and it's never been a difficult hill. But you know that in a race, when you're going all out and giving it your best, you're giving like that 100%. This at mile 26, it could be way steeper, you know that? like 40, 50 feet of elevation gain, maybe 1% grade, feels like 20% grade and 100 feet of elevation gain or whatever, I don't know, 200, 300 feet of elevation. Like it feels hard when you are tired and you're just trying to get to that finish line. So like I said, I really struggled through here. One thing that did really help was that the crowd energy really dies here until you get to Maniung. And then it kind of dies again, coming back out because you're going back through that same group. So it's relatively quiet. And if you're someone who's really struggling, that can compound the difficulty. But then as you kind of come back in uh, past Fairmount and down into uh, back towards downtown Philadelphia, the crowd energy definitely picks up and uh, can really help kind of get you through that last little bit of the race. Um, so came through beat this hill and then it's pretty much flat all the way through. Like I said, I ended with that 308.56, which is still a PR, which is great. I did miss the sub three goal, which is no big deal. Like I said, oh, I mean, okay. When I say it's no big deal, it still is a big deal. Like obviously I wanted the sub three, 
I can't control that I got sick. Um, other than like living in a bubble, like I can't control that I got sick. I can't control that I had to pull back from the taper and basically couldn't train that last week. Once you start the race, it is what it is. You can't control what happens on race day. You can only control your attitude and how, and your mindset and like how you perceive the performance. And so when I say it's no big deal or like it was all about the journey or those types of things that some people get upset about, me saying like, yes, I'm still upset about the goal. I wanted the sub three. I put 16 weeks of really hard training to get that sub three. I missed it. And the only thing I can do is take the positives. It was still a PR. I had an amazing time. I met a bunch of amazing people. I learned a lot about myself during this training block. What I like, what I don't like, things I can change in my next training block. So there are a lot of positives. So when I say no big deal or hey, uh, there's the next one, that's what I mean when I say those types of things is that there's always another race. This isn't like the end of everything. Like I can still run. I'm extremely lucky and beyond blessed that I can even run in the first place, that I have the ability to even chase a big goal like that, that I have the ability to travel somewhere, meet other running friends, meet people who also enjoy running and working and doing their best to just achieve what they can and push themselves. So that's when I say those types of things, that's what I really mean is that there's always another race. There's always another chance to be better than who I was the day before and attempt a PR. If that's below three hours, great. If it's a 307.56, great. If it's a 308.55, one second faster, that's still better than what I did before. I'm always learning and always growing and running. Those who just objectively only look at the numbers as whether or not you've succeeded in a training block and in a race that's very narrow-minded and honestly would make running very boring very fast um, and that's not why i do it yes the goals help me help to push me during my training and help to push me on race day but it's not why i do it and if you think it is then you're missing the bigger picture but here we go pace 708 heart rate 175 yeah heart rate was my heart rate started good and then it slowly kept creeping up and it was in the 180s. I think like mile six to mile eight was when it started hitting like the 180s. And then it was a battle for me to bring that heart rate back down into the 170s. And like that was also a telling sign was that pretty early on my heart rate got high and wasn't where it should be sitting. Like what I've seen in some of my training runs, especially those longer like 24 mile runs, like where I've seen my heart rate and where my heart rate was at on race day was telling that like I wasn't 100% back from being sick. Um, so that was also a tell that like, like I said, at the half and beyond that I knew if I got the sub three, it was gonna be a real battle and it would kind of be like a surprise. Cadence, I don't even pay attention to that. So it is what it is. Anyways, that is the race recap for Philly. Um, I'm super proud of the effort that I did. Um, I'm super happy with all the people I got to meet along the way on the race course during the shakeout run all race weekend. Thank you to anybody who gave me a shout out, um, either said hi before the race, whether it be at the expo, the shakeout run, um, or just being in Philly. I met quite a few people who recognized me from YouTube, which is just amazing. And then anyone who gave me a shout out during the race, it was just a huge boost to my confidence when I was really struggling, especially those last few miles. A few of you um, reached, like yelled out and said like, hey, you've got this, go chase that sub three. Like that helped give me motivation to just keep going, keep the legs moving. Even though I already knew the sub three wasn't happening, I knew there was still a chance at a PR and you do not know how much that actually helped me to keep going and not give up and just stop and start walking. Because when those mental battles start, it's the difference between somebody saying, hey, you've got this to like you telling yourself you don't have this. So thank you to every single person who cheered me on during the race, gave a shout out. Um, I tried to do the same and encourage any runner I passed. Um, Cause like I said, it's bigger than numbers. It's bigger than a goal. It's about encouraging others to keep moving and keep striving to be their best self, no matter what number is attached to that race or your race goal, whether it's a PR or not, whether you bonk or not, it's all about just moving forward and bettering yourself and being better than you were yesterday. I got big plans for 2024. I'm gonna take a little respite here from YouTube a few weeks off for the holidays, 
And then, like I said, big plans for 2024. So I'm super excited to announce those soon.